from birth, we are fostered to believe. We are fostered to believe in having human rights for all people. And that if we do not feel that we have these rights, we have the power to change. But what would it feel like if we did not have that power? When I was 16 years old, I went to Corn Island. It's a small island off the Atlantic coast of Nicaragua. And it was there that I learned what it might be like to live without that power. I had gone with my mother on a medical mission. We'd gone to set up clinics for people that would otherwise be unable to afford medical care. But I was 16 and medically untrained and was useless, pretty much. So instead of trying to make myself useful by doing random things for the medical group, I decided that I would talk to the local people about their lives and about health issues in general. I like to call this the beginning of my love-hate relationship with anthropology. But what I did discover on this island was a culture so unimaginably different than my own, a life that contained so many things beyond the boundaries of what I could possibly imagine a life to contain. This problem, this one of relatability, of not being able to relate to the situation that you're in, is not a new one in development. Academics from Muhammad Yunus to Amartya Sen to John Stedman will tell you that relatability is just a an, an development theory. And while these development theories are grounded in an empirical truth, it doesn't make them any more easy to understand. For example, the problem of coordination failure. It is grounded in the empirical truth that sometimes there is a disconnect between the developer and the developee. But it doesn't necessarily mean that because you know what coordination failure is, you can do anything about it. And all of this talk about development theory is really difficult to understand. So let's go back to Nicaragua so I can provide you a practical example of what I'm trying to get at. I remember that I was sitting in a one-room corrugated iron house that was typical of the barrio. You can see a picture of the barrio here. I promise for those of you sitting at the back, it actually looks a lot worse. The, the left side is the, all garbage and the houses are all made of mishmash. It's not like a pretty scene that it might look like. But I was sitting in this house and I remember that there was a clothesline that was drawn across the room over which the family had hung bedsheets. And on one side of the bedsheets, they had stacked all of their mattresses and had all of their clothes. And the other side of the room was the kitchen, the playpen, the dining room, the living room, whatever you want to call the other half of the room. And at night, they would take off these bed sheets and they would spread out the mattresses and that's how this family would sleep. And after an afternoon of getting to know the intimate details of every child in the family's history of diarrhea, which is not the most pleasant experience, I somehow really oddly felt welcome in the family. So the nine-year-old daughter was going to walk me home. But instead of walking me home, she walked me through the forest towards the church. And I was wondering, why is this nine-year-old girl walking me a full 20 minutes in the wrong direction? Surely she must know this is her island and she knows where she lives. But it was then that she told me a story, a story that it seemed nobody wanted me to hear. It was the story of her best friend, Maria Alejandra Cervantes who was just 13 when she hung herself from the tree in the churchyard. Sexually and physically abused for years, this girl had decided that life just wasn't worth it. And you know, the longer I stayed on the island, the more these stories came out of the woodworks the more they came from terrified eyes and from long, too silent mouths. Unfortunately, it seemed that Maria was not alone. 
The Foundation for Sustainable Development cites that there are a reported 55,000 cases of abuse in Nicaragua each year. And consider that this fact concerns about 18% of the population. And now consider that this proportion on the island, and particularly for minors, is even higher. Something had to be done. And I was essentially a useless minion of this medical team anyways, so I decided that I would join with some locals and we would develop an after-school program. This after-school program was intended to give girls a place to go. They would learn to make handicrafts, and those handicrafts would be sold at an airport. And the profits that the girls made from selling their handicrafts at the local airport would go into buying materials and also in funding eventual training that the volunteer teachers would receive in sexual abuse support. It wasn't meant to be anything really fancy, just a place for girls to go that they could talk, that they could perhaps mention something about their abuse and have an outlet. It was meant to give them a place to go instead of home to an abusive sibling or parent. But wait. Does any of this seem strange to anyone here? How is it possible that so many cases of abuse could be occurring within such a small parameter? The answer came one day to me when my self-proclaimed bodyguard, Troy, was going fishing. But what Troy meant by going fishing was not what you or I would conventionally think of as fishing. It turns out that boats going from Colombia to the United States dump their drugs into the ocean if they're going to be searched by the police. If the drugs are in the ocean, then nobody can prove where they came from. It also just so happens that this small island is situated within the current such that packages of floating drugs would happen to go relatively close by. And what Troy meant by going fishing was actually retrieving packages of floating drugs out of the ocean. And thus, my introduction to Nicaraguan gangs. There were two gangs on the island, each on respective sides of their island and each with their own respective territories, and each subsisting primarily off of drug sales. They had created what Donna Goldstein, an anthropologist who specializes in the favelas of Brazil, calls a parallel state. Each community was subjugated to the rule of law created by their respective gang. Now, this rule of law was from what I would consider a chauvinistic standpoint, but it seemed to be relatively normal on the island having children with multiple women, abuse, and having sex with minors was relatively normal. And the word police, it really meant nothing. There actually was, believe it or not, a police force on the island. It consisted of four 20-something-year-olds from the mainland, now, consider the two problems that this has to offer. Firstly, there is an entire police force consisting of four officers for a population of more than 6,000 people. And secondly, these Spanish-speaking mainlanders are on English-speaking Caribbean corn island. And now, let's think about what all of the things are that these boys had to deal with two competing gangs regularly fishing drugs out of the ocean, all the other pleasantries that come with two gangs having their own parallel states on an island, and how about being 20 alone in a place that doesn't speak your language with a place that doesn't really necessarily care that you're there? I mean, it's not a huge wonder why they were not that concerned with abuse. And you know, to be honest with you, I don't think that even if they had wanted to do something, they would have been able to. The unfortunate reality is that not all development projects succeed. 
and not all of those that, of those that succeed will survive. And here is my lesson to you. There is no way that I, as a 16-year-old, could have predicted the entire deviancy of the culture that existed on this island. There is no way that you should be so naive as to not know the culture and particular history of the place that you're going and expect to do great things. As you may have guessed by now, the school closed down. After three years of operation, this entirety of lack of infrastructure and gang problems and drug problems and police proved to be an insurmountable obstacle. But you know, it's also the reason that I am studying development. Failure is only a part of success. It's something to be considered and noted and improved upon. And the school, while it ran, did incredible things for so many people. Three years worth of things. And, and just to know that is enough for me. I enough to know that someone, somewhere, improved, enjoyed the fruits of my labor for even a moment. Enough to know that there can be even a small light in darkness. Thank you.